at SD Bullion. Our everyday low prices are already lower than the big boys' so-called flash sales. One of the fastest growing bullion companies in the country, SD Bullion, just claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500. So you have to ask yourself, why haven't you joined over 30,000 new customers who've recently made the switch to SD Bullion for the lowest gold, silver, and platinum bullion prices? To learn more, go to www.sdbullion.com and enjoy the lowest prices in the precious metals industry, period. This is the Doc with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Joining us today is our good friend, and he's also filling in for Eric, Craig Hemke of TF Metals Report. Craig, it's great to have you back on the show. Doc, I got to tell you, I'm just thrilled to get on one last time before the government shuts down your Putin-loving website. Well, Craig, I believe that's comrade, Doc, to you. Oh, I'm sorry, comrade. Yes. <laughs> Sieg Heil, all that stuff. <laughs> all right. Well, it has certainly been quite a month for the markets, not to mention just the past week. And, uh, I mean, it, it really all started on the night Trump was elected with gold and silver soaring early before uh, Modi's news from India broke. And it's been pretty brutal last three or four weeks for gold and silver. And we've had just as big, if not bigger, market-making moves in uh, bonds and interest rates. It's been uh, quite, the, quite the month, to say the least. Uh, but we do have a little bit of uh, light, perhaps, at the end of the tunnel here today. As uh, the jobs report came out uh, this morning, I think payrolls rose just under 180,000. The official government unemployment rate dropped to 4.6%. And gold and silver moved nicely off the lows. Um, silver was trading, I think, around 1630 early this morning, and um, it hit 1680, so it was up about 50 cents. We're recording late in the access market here on Friday, and it's uh, down a little bit, but still uh, well off of uh, the lows. Um, same thing for gold, and, and that's after a, we had somewhat of a reversal day yesterday. So let's start with gold and silver and the trading action here today. And your thoughts, Craig? Geez, Louise, Doc, that's a lot of questions all in one. <laughs> um, I wrote down a couple different things we've got to make sure we get back to. Let's start with the uh, reaction post-Trump. Uh, as you know, I'm, I've been banging this drum now for a couple of years, and I'm not getting tired, and I'm not going to stop. The only price discovered these days for gold is the price of the paper derivative. Um, and then that price is what's enforced upon the spot market. And all of us that play along and say, oh, yeah, that's gold. You know, what we see on CNBC and what we're told is the price of gold, we perpetuate that system. If you don't sell any, you don't have to take their price, okay? And you can use the uneconomic price to your advantage by buying some from SD Bullion this weekend because it's, it's clearly underpriced, undervalued versus um, oh, what the true value actually is. What the price that you see on the COMEX is the paper derivative price, and I would suggest, again, that it's no more related to the actual value of the underlying physical metal than is my left shoe. Uh, the two key factors that drive the HFT, primarily HFT demand for that paper derivative, are changes in interest rates and changes in Forex. And yep, over the last month since the election, we've seen uh, interest rates skyrocket as bond prices plunged. In fact, biggest move in the treasury market in history, biggest one day move the day after the election. That's something that's got to be uh, rather noteworthy. And then the, uh, the dollar yen relationship, the yen has weakened by about 13% in the three and a half weeks since the election. And so again, should come as no surprise that uh, paper gold exposure on the COMEX is also weakened by about 13% at the same time. So um, why is gold down since the election? Because interest rates moved up and the yen has moved down. Uh, it's, it's not a whole lot more complicated than that. And then you throw on the fact that we were approaching a December contract expiration with what had one time been all-time record high open interest just a few months ago. It clearly moved made to wash the entire COMEX cot structure out. And as of last night, we're all the way back down under 400,000 contracts of open interest, lower than where we began 
2016, which is amazing when you consider that we went from 400,000 up to 658,000 contracts in July, <laughs> and now we're all the way back to 400,000. So let's just, uh, that's the first part of your question. How's that? That's a pretty good um, start. All right, number two, let's go on to jobs because um, uh, right. if you, I know, uh, Doc, you like to sometimes take my free articles and put them um, on your site, and I very much appreciate that. Please consider the one I just wrote today. It doesn't even have any metals charts in it. It's all just about the lies, and it ties into what we spoke of earlier. You know, um, your site, Dave Kranzler's site, Mike Krieger's site. Uh, geez, all the way down to Naked Capitalism and Ron Paul all got put on this blacklist by the Washington Post a week ago. Um, as if, you know, I'm sure you guys are, did your check come from the Russians this week or did they skip a week just to kind of cover their tracks, Doc? Did that come in? No? I'm, uh, I'm still waiting for that. Well, you know, the mails run a little slow this time of year because all the Christmas packages, so maybe. It's true, it's, it's true. Now, it if, they were, if they were calling me uh a Canadian socialist uh, sympathizer that might, uh, they might have a little bit of leg there to run with that. When we were first starting, uh, Eric Sprott sent us a donation. So I have been funded by the Canadians, but there you go. Fortunately, not the Russians yet. Look, this is all part of uh, media message control. The clear media, mainstream media message was vote for Hillary Clinton, period, end of story. I mean, the, the bias and the endorsements and everything were record breaking. And then that didn't happen. And so now anybody, any website, any publication that opposed that view is being branded in almost as new McCarthyism as being, you know, run by the right. I mean, it's ridiculous. Well, what's coming next is not just a, 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 a political website or political news suppression, but financial news suppression. Because, again, all you have to do is search the headlines today, Yahoo, uh, Google, uh, market watch and they all tell you how great the jobs report is and again they're building this narrative within the what i call the financial political political media complex they're building this narrative that everything's great robust saw a lady on cnn say that this is the tailwind for the new trump administration what if, if you pour over the numbers now this is just over the last three months you, you take the actual Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers, okay? This, and this is just simple fact. This is the numbers they give us. The U.S. economy has created 638,000 part-time jobs while losing 99,000 full-time jobs. And that's how you get the net number over the last three months of 630, or 539,000 new jobs. They're all part-time. Now, we can get into the economic ration, you know, rationale for that, Obamacare, things like that. But what it really means is that there, there are no, I mean, it's not some robust economy where people are uh, starting new careers and, and moving up the corporate ladder. They're getting jobs at Walmart and delivering pizzas. And at the exact same time, the amount of households, the amount of individuals working multiple jobs, meaning multiple part-time jobs, is at the highest ever. The previous peak was in 2004. So at the end of the day, what you're told is this robust economy that demands an interest rate hike is in fact being carried on the backs of regular working class people that are working multiple jobs part time just simply to make ends meet. And again, that doesn't that doesn't jibe with what the mainstream media is no, putting out there as a message. And so therefore, I would say financial websites that don't toe the line are going to be the next uh, McCarthy-like uh, blacklist, red list uh, victims. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And quite a few of those already listed already fit that mold. I mean, yeah, already fit that mold, yeah. Silver Doctor, Zero Hedge. I mean, Zero Hedge dabbles in the political more than Silver Doctors does, but n neither Zero Hedge nor Silver Doctors are financial blog or uh, – or sorry, our uh, political blogs are we're not uh, we're not the Huffington Post. We're not um, we're not Breitbart. That it's all political. It's it's. And uh, you you ran the story about Hillary fainting at the uh, at the nine eleven thing and how you know you you're you're just trying to spin lies generated by the come on. I'd imagine that along with uh, breaking the story on Pizzagate probably is what did it. 
Well, yeah, that's that's a whole other story, man. <laughs> Look, I got to tell you, um, I didn't make the list, and uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm what was actually, with that? What's with that? Well, uh, that's the benefit of having the, the subscription the, model, right? Yeah, that's the benefit of having the twelve dollar a month subscription. Is Those that college professors can't see what you're writing? Right, exactly, <laughs> and and I don't have the traffic that I had three or four years ago either, which is. Perfectly fine with me, Doc. I tell you what, the next thing I'd be worried about, and I mean this in all seriousness, if we know, and we know this is true, that all of the uh, 501c3 corporations that had the word Tea Party or conservative in their name got essentially hung up by the IRS and audited, I'd say anybody with their name on that list is uh, should be expecting an envelope in the mail, too. Oh, yeah, so, probably. Uh, anyway, there's Especially there's a benefit to run a bullion business. They don't like that either. Oh, they're double barrel. I got to tell you, there is a benefit to toiling in relative anonymity, uh, and I'll take it. <laughs> uh, but I don't know the next round, and it's only going to get worse. I mean, uh, it, 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 the, the the spotlight from those that don't want the truth being told that interrupts their agenda. Uh, that spotlight's only going to get more uh, stark, and it's going to shine on all of us probably sooner rather than later. So, you know, where we joke about, I'm glad that we can still do this, Doc. I am still glad that, I am glad that we can still do this. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, that was a quote from 1984, wasn't it? George Orwell, uh, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, I just hope we're able to continue telling it. Again, the, today's jobs report is just, it's the... Um, it's just the latest example. And again, I just, anybody that's listening to it, I mean, you think, you see, that, and this is where I guess where it relates to the gold and silver discussion, because any, all these stories that we tell you about, whether they are political in nature or, or the, the economics that we just discussed with the jobs report, in the mainstream sense, that's, that doesn't fit the narrative. And, and so you're, you're maligned as, oh, you must just be some conspiracy theorist or a white nationalist or all these other national – uh, these terrible things that they say about um, people that don't fit uh, the narrative of what they want publicized. Um, well, the same thing is true about gold and silver. I mean I, we, I could, again, sit here for the next 10 minutes and talk about the historical fact of government gold price – Suppression and manipulation, going back to a, it's really as soon as Bretton Woods was signed. Um, the U.S. lost a third of its gold reserves in the late 1950s, uh, be, trying to defend $35 an ounce. There were hearings on Capitol Hill. It was a scandal in 1958 that this had, that this had happened. And so the U.S. said, well, we're not going to do this alone. And so they enlisted seven other countries. And the U.S. took a 25% share in what was called the London Gold Pool. Anybody can look up and see how that worked. That worked from 61 to 68 until it failed, until it got overrun. And then in 1975, recognizing that the U.S. was no longer going to provide physical metal and couldn't do it anyway, ah, true alchemy was, in, was finally uh, perfected through uh, the use of derivatives. And derivative pricing, and oh no, that really is gold. It's just gold exposure. It's pretend, and it's and then whether that now is stretched from futures contracts to unallocated accounts to the GLD, it's all BS. It's all garbage. It's all just gold exposure. It's not the real thing, but it's allowed them to multiply by 10, 20, some say even 100 times the amount of actual physical gold that is there, and thereby, if you can pretend the supply is 100 times what it really is, that's how you suppress the price. Again, this isn't, I'm not just like spinning wacky yarns, making up shit. This is, <laughs> this is how it actually works. This is historical fact. So anyway, uh, as long though, as you are telling a story that doesn't fit the narrative that the banker, again, the, the bankers, the financial, political, media complex wants out there, then you're marginalized as either a, uh, a Putin loving, you know, uh, fascist or a conspiracy theorist. That's how it works. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I agree with you that we're likely to, to see them uh, go further down that pathway, especially if they see it gaining traction. But on the same hand, I also have somewhat of a gut feeling that it's it also, it's pretty risky. It could backfire in a pretty big way. I mean, the fact that they can't just use the label, the label conspiracy theorist anymore, 
because half of the country believes in conspiracy theories. Um, when you label something as fake news, the average person, number one, now they're suddenly going to zerohedge.com. Now they're going to Ron Paul's Institute and all the other uh, websites on the list to check them out for themselves. And, and number two, it makes them actually evaluate. Like the, the label conspiracy theorist, I mean, it's, it's rather opaque. It's, it's, uh, it's not something that can be easily fact-checked. But when you just label something fake news and it's actually the truth, not everyone can understand the truth. But uh, for a large portion of the population, if they're exposed to the truth, it rings true and it rings home. And they recognize that. So I, I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, I have uh, a feeling that there's more chance than um, our uh, little niche here in uh, cyberspace has given thought to the fact that this could epically backfire for the elite. We'll see. Yeah, no, you're right, Doc. And that, and that would be the, the best case example. Uh, no, no best case scenario. Um, no doubt about that. I, I just would, I guess, draw attention again to just this one point today of the employment report. Uh, I encourage everybody to, if they haven't already, look at your, you know, whatever homepage is you open up when you open up a web browser. You know, look through what the stories are listed on Yahoo uh, or, you know, Google uh, November employment report and hit news and just see what the, uh, the tone and the context of the mainstream media reporting is. And then, again, look at what the facts are, the actual facts. You know, again, Stanley Fisher, number two at the Fed, says the U.S. is at full employment. Really, Stan? 95 million people not in the workforce and we're at full employment? You know, who's, who's a conspiracy theorist and who is telling the truth? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, if, if, and I think it's a great example, again, that if, uh, that just shows you, just today, shows you how the media, the financial media, uh, in, this, in this case, tries to spin things a certain way in order to shape public opinion. You know, the classic mope that uh, Jim Sinclair always spoke about, management of perceptions. Um, but you can see then, if, if that's how they spin certain just individual economic events, then you know that that's how they spin pretty much every story. And people just need to understand that so they're not caught flat-footed when uh, things get worse. Exactly. Getting back to the markets a little bit, let's talk about today's jobs reports um, in relation to the potential for a Fed rate hike here in a couple of weeks. Um, we, were chatting, yeah. we were chatting before the show that I just had a gut feeling this morning watching the trading action on the news that – um, it, it almost felt like the rate hike was announced this morning and how the gold and silver markets were reacting. Yeah. I, I've been talking on my site since September. I actually thought, because we'd watched long rates into the September FOMC. Long rates went from 210 back in July to about 260. And, and, and most folks have seen how LIBOR has moved up. Well, all of that happened before in last fall before the Fed hiked rates last December. And so I was actually telling my people on my site, you know, there's a halfway decent chance you're going to get a rate hike in September. And then when it didn't happen, we're like, oh, crap, that means another 90 days of this, you know, job owning and everything else that goes with it. Um, now it's, it looks like it's a fait accompli. Um, but getting how this pertains to how this affects gold and by extension silver, you know, we mentioned earlier, you know, this paper gold exposure that trades – Derivative style on the COMEX is influenced primarily by the bond market and by uh, the dollar yen and in Forex. Um, if you then instead look at like, let's say the dollar index as like a summation of the dollar against all the other major fiat currencies. Dollar index since the election has gone from 95 to almost 102, breaking out to multi-year highs. Um, but you're right. Today, it kind of feels like the metals are feeling a little bit better. And if anything, that's because interest rates have eased back off. The long bond got to 315 yesterday. It's back down to like 304 today. And the dollar index is back down below 101. And if uh, anybody wants to pull up uh, a, uh, a chart of the dollar index, you know, one of the basic kind of topping patterns that any amateur technician will notice is a, what we call a head and shoulder. You look at the chart and you see what looks like a shoulder, a higher high that's a head, and then a bounce, and then a fall down, and then a 
a right shoulder, you know, and you can see that on the daily chart of the dollar index. If, if it were to start breaking down now and get back down below 100, which is the previous breakout level that it couldn't get through in 2015 or early part of this year, it would begin to look like a false breakout. And if that's the case, well, this whole narrative that's been shoved down everybody's throat since the election of higher dollar and higher interest rates and all this other stuff uh, begins to unwind. So we'll see uh, how this plays out, but I want everybody to keep an eye on the dollar index and uh, perhaps, and this is another thing we've been talking about on my side, perhaps what you get a week from Wednesday is uh, one of these uh, sell the rumor, buy the news events where all of the damage, all of the selling has been done in the lead up to the news, in this case, the rate hike. And that things may actually rally afterwards. And if you remember back last December, I mean, exactly all of this what we saw last in, December. Exactly. And, and actually, the price action in gold and silver in November of last year was almost identical to what we just went through. It's just, you know, we had such a great first half of the year, but he forgot about it. But prices peaked in late October last year and then just got the crap beat out of them all through November. And price, though, then bottomed ahead of and into that hike. It then the actual bottom in gold came the very next day, Thursday, the 17th of December last year. The low in the GLD inventory came that day as well. And then we began to kind of round up. And then as the currencies got really dicey and volatile in January and February, that's when gold spiked. And then, you know, it was higher from there into July. So uh, it wouldn't be without precedent that this rate hike by higher December. we're talking it was like what three hundred dollars in gold and yeah at about eight dollars in silver yeah it wouldn't be unprecedented for the same thing to happen again for many of the same reasons you know this dollar strength causes emerging market stress you know you got bond losses everywhere and uh dollar crises and liquidity crises and all the emerging markets and all of a sudden that rattles through and i you could very easily be looking at uh, many of the same conditions uh, by late December, early January that we had last year. So this notion that, you know, as soon as gold goes down, you know, all of a sudden every single perma bear from, you know, Trader Dick to the jailbird comes out of the woodwork to tell you about how we're going to 900, you know, and that's a long ways away. I mean, who knows? Yeah. If the yen were to rally another 50 or fall by another 50%, maybe the machines would try to sell it off that far. But, just because we've had a few down ticks, you know, over the last month, and I don't mean to marginalize, you know, the 13% drop, but that doesn't mean we're going to fall another 30. So uh, people just need to recognize that uh, what they're being told by uh, the media and uh, hedge fund salespeople, you know, that, that hit the headlines, that it's some easy linear, to, easy to predict linear process. You know, that Trump's going to spend all this money and and the debt's going to go up and inflation's going to go up and infrastructure spending and all that. And like there's some kind of supply side. Who cares about the debt nirvana right around the corner? Um, it may not play out exactly as some of these people are are projecting. And so we'll just see, Doc, I, I suspect by the next time we do one of these things, God willing, <laughs> government, <laughs> NSA willing, um, uh, things may look a little different. Yeah, because they don't—they certainly don't seem to be projecting QE4, five and six, which have to be coming if a massive infrastructure uh, spending plan is coming. Right, right. You know, uh, the one not thing to, not I, to mention if rates continue moving up. So you had infrastructure spending plus rates uh, going up, and I mean, you're staring at uh, a couple more QEs. Well, and 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 uh, this would be a good time to mention something else that's on your radar and on my radar as we go into this weekend, and that is this uh, referendum vote in Italy that, yeah, you can kind of scrape around and find a little bit of discussion on that, you know, especially if you read Zero Hedge or some of these other uh, websites like yours and mine, but I don't think you're hearing a lot about it, you know, or being focused upon really on Bloomberg or CNBS or any place like that today or this week. There's a vote coming up on Sunday that in a sense is kind of a, a national no confidence vote, if you want to put it that way, on the current prime minister and his government. Um, if it fails, uh, the, what, it doesn't, it's not an immediate 
like direct up or down in or out vote like Brexit was back on June the 23rd. But if it fails and if it's a no vote on Sunday, people will quickly connect the dots to go from where we are Monday in the event of a no vote to where we could be six, eight, nine months from now. And that would be an Italian, that's called an Italexit type vote. Uh, right, because, uh, I mean, when you, when you have uh, your normalcy bias and you're viewing the market in a certain way, um, your mind can rationalize or attempt to rationalize Brexit as a one-off. Uh, right. But when you've that's seen Brexit know. and you thought that was a one-off because you didn't really understand what was behind tr- Brexit, what caused it, uh, the momentum of pushing it, and you didn't forecast it, you didn't think it was possible, that's just a crazy one-off, those crazy Brits. But then mm-hmm. you see Trump happen. Mm-hmm. here in the U.S., and then you see Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's going to break through your normalcy bias. Um, and we're not talking everyone. We're not talking the snowflakes here in the in the U.S. that probably aren't giving you notice, but we're talking managed money and people who have to uh, trade for a living. Right. And, uh, and that forces you out of your normalcy bias. Like I remember discussing with you after the Brexit thing last summer about how uh, England leaving the European Union was a fatal uh, wound to the euro. It, it didn't mean that they were dead on the spot. You know, it was kind of like realized it yet. Right. It's like Inigo Montoya sitting there getting stabbed, you know, right. And, uh, but he keeps on fighting. Um, but if you've been wounded, you can keep going, you know, until you finally collapse, you know, it was a fatal wound. You just didn't bleed out yet. Um, and what I meant by that at the time is that it's a fatal wound and that this is only going to inspire other parts of the EU to do the same thing. You know, if, if it's Italy or if it's France or if it's, uh, you know, Belgium or, you know, whatever, um, that that currency has been, again, I think fatally wounded. So now uh, you and I know that the only thing that will eventually break the banker domination of the precious metals, uh, paper derivative markets and the suppression of the price and the hyper leverage and the rehypothecation and, and, you know, make the proverbial music stop. The only thing that will do it is physical demand. You know, where finally people are demanding the physical metal and the bank, you know, is saying, look, uh, here, sign this form, come back in 120 days and we may have some for you. No, 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 no. You told me I had gold here. I want my gold. Like the people in George Bailey's uh, lobby, you know, uh, same thing. It's a fractional reserve confidence game. And physical demand will finally break that confidence game, break that confidence that the gold is there and then all hell breaks loose. Physical demand is the only thing that's going to do it. And now you're talking about the entire continent of Europe where not only is their currency uh, wounded, may perhaps fatally and going away, you're still dealing with sharply negative interest rates. That, uh, actually, I posted a thing about a week ago, the, the two-year Bund in Germany, lower than it has been Ever at negative 72 basis points. So, so you're being asked as a European citizen to save, actually pay the bank for the privilege of holding your currency, and it's a currency that's devaluing and may go away. I mean, it won't take a whole lot of people to see, see through that and go, well, the hell with this. And again, we're already seeing the record sales for safes in Germany. And if you have a million dollars or a million euros or whatever, so... Say, Craig, you have a million euros, and suddenly, okay. suddenly your interest rate uh, in your bank goes from a quarter of a percent to negative a quarter percent or mm-hmm. negative half a percent or negative one percent, whatever. It is. Yeah, but, I mean, psychologically, even if it's negative 0.01 percent, what are you going to do? You're going to – I mean, say you don't have a million. Say you have 20,000. Yeah. You're, you're going to pull it out for cash. That's exactly why they're targeting cash. That's why they're targeting the 500-euro note. Um, that's why what we're seeing in yep. India, that's why Larry Summers is targeting the freaking hundred dollar bill in the U S yep. is because they know that in order to steal the population's money through negative interest rates, that has to be in the banking system. It can't be sitting outside the banking system in cash. That is exactly 100% precisely correct. Uh, that is the proper reading and connecting of the dots. No doubt about it. And anybody that is listening to us should go back and listen to that again, because that's how it works. And that's why they're if you in the U.S., there's about one point three trillion dollars of actual currency. 
okay, the bills. I don't know what the true money, what the money supply is like 10 times that. That's all the digital stuff, right? All the zeros and ones. But in actual currency and coins, it's $1.3 trillion. If you just eliminate the $100 bill, eliminate it entirely, you eliminate about $700 billion of it, more than half. I mean, who's going to go into their their bank and say, I need $10,000. I'm not going to let you charge me 1% a year. And then go walking out with, I mean, how the hell many 20s is that? 5,000? Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, you're not going to, I mean, that makes it nearly impossible. And that's what the, that's why they're trying to, oh yeah, we're going to eliminate the, you know, the the black market. And, uh, you know, only bookies and drug dealers use $100 bills. (laughs) You know, that's, (laughs) That's how they try to explain it away. No, they are setting the table for, for negative interest rates and, and confiscation, bail-in. Uh, so, yeah, Doc, you're, you're right on, brother. And then if you can connect those dots, you can see what the citizen's response is going to be. So if you can't uh, take your cash out of the banking system because they've demonetized uh, notes that are actually usable, I mean, if you take – $20,000 out or $100,000 out and they're making you take ones and you don't want to fill up your whole second story or basement with ones. Yeah. What is your next response going to be? Okay, well, gold's a pretty good looking option. Exactly. So if you put two and two together, you can see that the war on cash is going to morph into the war on gold. And yep. We haven't seen it yet. I mean, we've seen it from the standpoint that they bash it. They try to manipulate sentiment, but we haven't yet seen a war on gold like right now. We're seeing a war on cash of trying to demonetize it or criminalize it or tax it or whatever their plan is going to be. So, yeah, it makes you wonder where it all heads. No doubt about it. I mean, in the meantime, I, that's right. why you know we can saw all this wailing and grinding of teeth, you know, about gold being down 15 percent or whatever it is from its highs and all that kind of stuff and. I, and I don't, I'm not, again, I don't want to try to downplay, you know, that, that, that sucks, you know, and everybody was excited back in the summertime and we we're finally making some progress and now here we are and the cot structure and all that other jazz. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, seriously, unless you're selling it and why does it even matter? You just got to remember why you bought it in the first place. You know, it's, it's wealth protection against all of the stuff that we've just spent 10 minutes talking about. And if you're not done buying it, your insurance is on sale now. That's absolutely right. And I'm sure SD Bullion has the lowest prices out there, right? Yeah, we... uh, Yeah, damn right. (laughs) Tried to tee that one up for you, Doc. I appreciate that, but... Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's why we started SD Bullion. I mean, we're two guys, uh, Joe Schmoes, who believe in the stuff, and... I mean, it's crazy. A lot of the, the big guys in the industry, like, as we've grown and met with them and attended shows. I mean, I'm not going to name names, but it's just crazy how many of them, it's just a big business and they yeah. don't, they don't believe in the stuff. They don't own it, own it themselves. They don't allow their employees to like invest their 401ks or IRAs in it. Yeah. Like, like seriously, like you don't allow your employees to invest in this stuff. Like their employees don't buy it and own it. Like we, I mean, we started this, um, way back in the day as a way to uh, get gold and silver buyers to make big buys together and get uh, better prices. Because at the time, there was just one mm-hmm. main big online dealer and premiums were high. And I mean, now there's lots of options. So, No, Doc, you're absolutely right. And, uh, uh, and it's almost like the mining companies are the same way, right? They're all run by these geologists that have been right. spent so much time out in the sun breaking rocks that their brains have been fried. Um, like the whole mining but, sector doesn't believe in this stuff outside right. of Right. Like... Uh, Maybe a McEwen or a Newmeyer. Right. They ought to, I mean, they're just, they might as well just be harvesting grain, you know, or digging coal right. out of a mountainside. That's, that's all the value it is to them. But, but, Doc, let's be honest. I mean, at the end of the day, you and I, uh, we champion the cause of sound money and gold ownership as, as protection of your wealth, mainly just because we're charlatans. You know, they're trying to get the hoi polloi to fall for some uh, brain dead scheme and conspiracy theory. Come on, let's just admit it. You know, that's, yeah, but that's what, but that's what they say. That's what they me say. personally, I'm just trying to unload all my own gold and silver. So. Exactly. Exactly. To the, un- <laughs> to the duped masses out there. I actually get that a lot. Oh shit. Excuse me. Me too. 
It's like I'm, you know, like I'm like, oh, you know, that turd, he's just trying to sell subscriptions at $10 a month. And he's got to, he's got to get in there and, and buy his kids some new shoes for Christmas. So he's just trying to sell more subscriptions, $10, $10 a month. Give me a break. But yeah, you know, I hear quite a bit, like, if you really believe in this stuff, why are you selling it? Why don't you keep it? And so uh, I've, uh, the reply I've developed that uh, um, I've used lately, because I mean, it makes sense and people get it then is, uh, you go to Kroger or Fred Meyer or whatever your grocery store is that you go to, and whoever owns that, whether it's stockholders or uh, if it's a privately owned company, you think they don't believe in milk? You think they don't believe in bread and eggs? Like, yeah, just because they're selling it doesn't mean they don't believe in it. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, you got there are a lot of bitter people out there that just want to assume the worst in all human nature, right? And I you just ignore them. I mean, that's what I do. I mean, I read the stuff. I I see the, I've got trolls that follow me around. I'm sure there'll be trolls on this interview on your site. I, I don't even care. I mean, like it matters what they say. They're, they're, they're fools. So anyway. A lot uh, of it's sentiment related and we're, uh, yeah, yeah. that's definitely down before we were joking before the show about your old tits and a uh, sentiment indicator and there's, it's sagging right now. And, and again, I don't want to, I'm not trying to belittle the fact that, that, that silver's a third of what it was five years ago on a dollar price, or that gold's come back down another 15. And, it, and yeah, that sucks. But again, I mean, the, the people who make it sound like, you know, you and I and all the rest have some kind of agenda trying to screw people um, when we're trying to fight a fight against the most powerful forces in nature, which are the banks. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty tough challenge that we have. Um, anyway, I, I, I digress. I, I did the third part of your initial question, which we're now just getting to. <laughs> oh my God, people are like, oh, how long is this going to go? Um, silver and the metals perhaps turning. Um, a lot of, well, let's talk about gold first. Gold was broken down initially at the uh, end of September with two massive orders that occurred one second apart on COMEX hours that broke the 50-day moving average. One Friday later, the exact same trick enabled the 100-day moving average to be broken. And then uh, we broke through the 200-day moving average. Uh, let me think of when that was. Uh, last, uh, it was right after, let me think, I remember right, that was right after the election because we'd been riding the 200-day moving average for a long time. Uh, silver had a similar trip down. It finally, uh, it was holding its 200-day moving average all the way up until Friday the 11th of November, where, remember, it fell like $2 in one day. That got it below its 200-day moving average. All of this is what, you know, seeing those technical signals, that's what led the machines, the algos, the HFTs that, that trade, buy, and sell this metals exposure on the COMEX to sell because of the technical picture, kind of pushed them out. And it allowed the shorts to get bought back. And, you know, now we're going to enter just a regular delivery phase, you know, with no great shakes on the COMEX. Um, so now, uh, are we going to get a turn? The key thing that I've been watching, the key long-term indicator, and again, I didn't invite anybody to pull this up and decide whether it's valid or not, is the 100-week moving average. Go to a site like... Uh, let's see, investing.com or barchart.com is a real easy place to do it. Pull up a weekly chart and then plot the 100-week moving average and look specifically at the action this year. And you'll find it's very valid in terms of determining trend. Uh, it was a struggle to get through. And then once we got through those the, earlier this year, they came back and tested the 100-week moving average of support and then both metals shot higher. Uh, we've now come down. Unfortunately, gold is below its 100-week moving average. Makes you wonder if it might still be going lower. But silver has held it very well. It's about 1640 in silver. And if you look at again, if you look at the chart, you can see how that area around 1640 has been stout support for the last couple of weeks. Um, let's just see now if if we can't get a turnaround. All of this action in the base metals is helping. Copper being at 15, 16 month highs big turnaround in zinc this year. Palladium is looking pretty good. Aluminum uh, is up and down the board in terms of uh, industrial metals. That's kind of spilling over and helping silver a little bit because of silver's industrial components. So uh, to your original point, I have just things look a little bit better. Yeah, they feel a little bit better in the action uh, here late this week. 
And now let's just see if we can't get through this FOMC in, in that classic sell the rumor by the news. And then let's just see what 2016 has in store for us beginning with what will be a rather volatile January. To say the least, to say the least. All right. Well, before we wrap the show, Craig, um, if you can let the listeners know where they can find uh, your regular reports as well as um, your premium work. Yes. Uh, if you want to be pillaged for 40 cents a day, uh, please join us at tfmetalsreport.com. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, TF Metals Report. Look, the real I, I, I charge 40 cents a day, one, so I can make a living at this and pay all the bills associated with having a website. Uh, Health care costs being one of them. We won't even talk about that. Jeez <laughs> Louise. Um, nonetheless, uh, I do that. But the real value, and I will always maintain this, the real value of my site is in the contributions of the members. Uh, people come to TF Metals Report because we all tend to see the world for what it is. And we're all in the same boat together. And so the links that are provided, the perspective, the wisdom, the experience of all the members is what really makes the site valuable. I do a, usually I write up something every day. I do a podcast every day, we do webinars once a week, uh, just to kind of provide further insight for what it's worth. And that's, like I said, that's 40 cents a day, 12 bucks a month. But, uh, but the sites also, there's a big free component too. Again, I just, look, if, if what, the doc and I have talked about today uh, makes you think that, yeah, you know, this might be worth looking into. Yeah. Just check us out. TFmetalsReport.com. I've been a subscriber for years and I highly recommend it. So, uh, Oh, doc. Thanks. TFmetalsReport.com. All right. So for the doc and our good friend, Craig, Hemke, thanks for tuning into this week's SD weekly metals and markets.